Fort McMurray, Alberta, lies in the heart of Canada's booming but sometimes controversial economic engine. And just 30 minutes south of the city, there is a First Nations community that is attracting a lot of attention. A nation with revitalized community, culture, industry, education, and a hopeful future. But these promising changes are very recent. The nation still grapples with a history of colonization, dysfunction, the loss of their land and culture, and they face contradictions between new opportunities and their identity as keepers of the land. This is a First Nation standing at an historic crossroads. Can the nation balance progress and success with the traditions and values that have strengthened its people in the past? This is a nation hunting for its own future. When we were asked to make a portrait of this First Nations community, we were honored and a little frightened. As outsiders, how could we do justice to their story? But you could also say that this is not the film we made, but the film we were given. A story that was entrusted to us. A story given in kindness and with a generosity of spirit that has inspired us. It is a story of a people caught between past and future, between tradition and material progress. And the recent prosperity is all the more remarkable, considering the painful history this nation has had to endure. Good morning, Fort McMurray First Nation. This is Sarah speaking. Yeah. So sufferings from dysfunction are still completely affecting our community every day. Um, they all essentially stem from residential schools and the oppression, every, everything that our people have been through since essentially Christopher Columbus came over. During the fur trade, there was value to have First Nations involved. When uh, resources found around the Great Lakes, First Nations people now become an obstacle, put onto reserves. It's that simple. Control. When our forefathers signed a treaty, they expected the federal government to honor it, which I haven't. If you ask any of our elders, possibly any of our community me members, whether they honored it, the answer would be a d distinctive no. You think about the land, the land was used for everything from food to water, to clothing, to education, to health, everything. The most valuable resource to the basic essentials of life it's been stripped away and taken. There was people in the area here for, for probably hundreds of years prior to us being here, as evidenced by this rock, which was found about three feet down in the ground. Call it our sacred rock. For sure, this rock is gonna be staying with us forever. At the loss of land, uh, putting people on in, in residential schools, you know, losing their culture that way and, and languages, uh, forcing them to speak English or French rather than their own languages. You know, all those things had, had uh, uh, an impact of lessening people's self-worth. When they took these children away from their parents, they sent them back home with no souls. You can still see some of that, that loss there, the soulless children who are reaching for the bottle and whatever they can reach for to, to try to find a life for themselves. We're kind of lost ourselves and we're, what are we trying to pass down to our kids? Nothing, because it was taken away from us. Walking down the road you're taken, your parents don't even, didn't even know where you were. One of the supervisors threw me into my room for three days and uh, didn't allow anyone to come in or give me food or nothing. I think I was five years old that time. And I also learned that that school that I was in, it closed in 2004, I think. There's been rumors and stories, which I believe, that probably maybe 20 to 30 percent of the children they took did not survive. That is a legacy that we are dealing with today, and it's going to need an awful lot to go through our own healing and our own um, building up of our, our self-worth once again. Of course there's going to be dysfunction. It was, it was set up to create dysfunction and chaos. That's, 
that was, that's the whole game. If you have poverty, lack of education, um, lack of self-worth, what do you have? You have a lot of social problems and uh, it, it has an impact on people. Yeah, I can remember fights out here, cops everywhere, nuts. You couldn't go out of town for a weekend without somebody breaking into your house. There was no life here. In 2017, it's Canada's 150th birthday with celebrations across the country. First Nations communities have another perspective. 150 years ago, we're celebrating it this year. What happened 150 years ago? Colonization of the First Nation people. They have rights as any nation would. They have not only human rights, which, by the way, were only given to First Nations in 2008. There's over 600 First Nations across Canada, 600 distinct First Nations, and yet most of the time when you're driving through one, you can recognize it is a reserve. That's from the Indian Act. You know, the difference between the Indian Act and our treaty rights, our treaty is something our ancestors entered into in good faith with the Canadian government. The Indian Act is something that was imposed on our people. There's been a system created under the Indian Act and then if we don't change that through being self-governant, independent nations, that's all it's ever gonna be versus controlling our own destiny. The Indian Act disempowers our people. It takes the responsibility for our future away from us and takes the power away from us. And gives it to who? And gives it to Canada. Which makes you wonder, what makes a nation a nation? What makes a people a people? Is it their common cause? Is it sameness? Or is it complementary differences? Is it passion and love? You know, all the, the previous um, generations before us, you know, they built a road for us, right? They worked long and hard, and obviously they had a, a vision, right? And they just kept on going, and a lot of them died for us. Our elders, all our ancestors died for us, just so that we can have a better life. That's what I believe in. In the past eight years, Fort McMurray First Nation has flourished. And at the heart of those changes is a visionary goal. We always talk to our people about self-government and why that's important. The Indian Act stops us from taking responsibility for our future. We need to get out from that. Because the system that is created today creates dependency. Doesn't matter what it is, if it's education, culture, it's if you're not self-sufficient where you're controlling your own outcomes, you're never gonna achieve it. If you're always allowing someone else, you're always gonna achieve what they want you to achieve. What do you, it, get? What do you get if you do that? You control your own destiny. Our, our First Nation is in the middle of the economic engine of Canada, and yet we still have the same problems as most other First Nations do across Canada. Social issues, housing issues, substance abuse. These problems can't be solved by throwing money at them. These problems go way deeper than that. It's about our people being able to take responsibility for their future. That's the most empowering thing you can tell a person is you're responsible for your future. The decisions you make are gonna affect your future. The goal and vision of 468 is to become a self-sufficient nation for the next seven generations, to protect their future, to command their own destiny. But it is only very recently that they have started to make these changes. How was it that they were able to really start to turn things around? I think I'm the one that put the chief to become a chief because he was my cousin and I knew him well and then. I said, what are you doing? He said, nothing, I'm not doing anything right now. I said, why don't you become a chief? He just laughed, he said, uh, I don't know how to be a chief. Well, I said, nobody that ever became a chief knew anything about being a chief to begin with. <laughs> I knew I'm not educated enough to do all this kind of stuff, so I thought if I hired people, I could make it work. I guess the biggest reason would be to, to straighten out this reserve uh, any way that I knew how. I knew I could do it. I just got to, you know, put the right people in place. And My grandmother married a non-Aboriginal person in the 50s, and she had all her treaty rights removed. As a result of that, I grew up away from the reserve, away from my First Nation, and I lost all that culture. I didn't come back here until 2012 when I was 40 years old. And, you know, what I discovered, there's, there's a bunch of strong intelligent people are living here just trying to make a better future for all the First Nation people. 
you know, these, these people, they accepted me. They taught me so much. They inspired me to work hard to make sure that failure is not an option. And over the last six years, Chief Counsel have did some, some wonderful things and accomplished many things. We have a business that's thriving, you know, established just little things as coming to work at 8 a.m. And, and being here at 8 a.m. To protect the reserve, I guess I think maybe, you know, like set, setting goals. If everybody's do, starting this clean up now and if some crazy guy comes in here and starts trying to do wrong and mess up their <laughs> whatever, I don't think it's going to go very far now. My vision was to build a reserve and build it like a town, right? Have all the laws and everything that comes with it. When you're driving down the highway, they're going to see the, you know, the new gas station. They're going to see a health center there. There's a little Head Start building, and uh, we have uh, 44 new houses. Along with the deliberate developments taking place, there is also a renewed sense of pride in the community. Not only are off-reserve band members moving back, but they're bringing outsiders with them. Um, I was able to uh, talk James into coming to the reserve. He's the only cowboy on the re reservation, I have to point that out. I don't know, I kind of think he th thinks he's still in Texas. At first, everybody looked at him like, who are you and what do you want and all that stuff, but it's, he, I think he's grown on people as well. <laughs> so. Once we moved up here from Texas, uh, Chief and Council took her and I around to pick out a lot. This is what we built from nothing, absolutely nothing. Beautifying our yards, sticking around our home, seems to be having an effect on the people around here because I had a conversation with my auntie, Dorothy, and she said, holy, what you guys are doing there, we have not done in 70 years. And I don't know why we didn't think of that, but so it's catching on, I think. I, I see a lot more buildings coming up. I see a lot of yards being maintained and grass being cut. And, it's good because where we live is beautiful. There's no place like it and there's no place like home. Yeah. <laughs> it's very special to have all four of my family members here. My mom being the first generation, myself being next, my daughter who moved back here when I moved back here. And then she had my granddaughter just, just this year. Four generations. <laughs> <laughs> the developments taking place here are no accident. They are the conscious will of the people through a series of community meetings, the band members agreed on eight pillars that are fundamental to the growth and development of their nation. It is a plan they have committed to, not just for the next few years or even the next decade. This is their plan for the next seven generations. It's one goal set through our eight pillars. Every day you come to work trying to achieve those eight pillars. That's it. So what prosperity means to me is not necessarily the money. It's about coming together and, and being united to tackle the issues that we face as a nation. Our, our First Nation is lucky to be right in the middle of the economic engine of Canada. We get a, approximately three, three and a half million dollars a year from federal funding. With our industry partners, we bring in another 30 to 40 million dollars. That goes right back into this local area. Not all of the uh, reserve do that. We're trying to drag us out of that system to try and put everything back into the reserve that, you know, that we get from industry, right? Right now it's probably, you know, roughly 70% as far as, you know, what we get from industry to run this nation as a nation, right? What, we, what can we count on every year? You know, the relationships of industry, you know, providing a world-class service to them, right? The band-owned business is called Christina River Enterprises, or CRE. They bid on contracts to do work on the oil sites, and they win those contracts on equal footing with any other company. They provide security, run heavy equipment, water trucks, and many other services. I came into contact with the Fort McMurray 468 First Nation in uh, about 10 years ago. The expectations are high. They were in a business that requires high thresholds of competence and quality. The businesses 10 years ago couldn't compete uh, like they can now. And that's a big deal. That goes back to Chief, Chief Ron's work ethic, you know, and he knows what it takes 
to make the wheels turn and it's showing up every day. It's digging in, it's working hard and it's, you know, expecting more from people um, because you know they're capable of it. How are you? So before the Aboriginal Head Start that we have now, um, there were no options for childcare. We're teaching our children to be proud of who they are. So we invite elders to come into our program and they do um, round dances, they do um, traditional language. We have a Cree wall in a Cree corner in the back and so we teach the children um, common Cree words. So uh, my daughter was able to attend full time so I can uh, get my GED. Like I had to not only do it for myself but I had to do it for her too to show her like if I can do it then you can do it, you know. So I'm sorry, I'm going to cry. I think this is an awesome program because when my children were growing up, we didn't have this. Now it's here and I see so much difference in the children. I think it's important to promote education and really get them to see that there's more out there. They can go to college, they can go to university, they can go and be a doctor if they want. It's just about the youth and giving them hope. I'm planning on going to college, I don't even know where yet, but, <laughs> and then I want to be a police officer one day. Officer? Hell no. no. What the hell is wrong with you? What do you mean? <laughs> I want to be a police officer because I want to make a change in, like, wherever I am. I want to get bad people off the streets, and I want to get, like, fentanyl off the streets, too. <laughs> Seeing people living in a, you know, third world country, it seemed like. That's why I picked housing to be my priority, right? We have uh, 44 new houses. It kind of gives them a little push to kind of go up. A house here on the res should be no different than a house anywhere else. Because if nobody stays here, this reserve won't be here, right? So we got to make it attractive for them to want to live here. Currently, we're working on getting water and wastewater uh, utilities to the nation. We received exciting news. We got word that INAC was actually going to support, with funding over five years, $25 million to help bring water and sewer to the nation. It's not only a beautiful thing for the community members to be self-sufficient and feel good about themselves and their homes. When they wake up in the morning and they want to turn on their tap, they don't have to feel as though, you know, they're underprivileged. It tells them that they matter. <laughs> Our CEO, Brad, came in to have a meeting with me one day. And he's like, you know what, Fran, do what you need to do. Dream big, shoot for the stars. We do over 50 programs a year in this, this little tiny health center, and we provide that to our people all year long. Well, the medical care has changed dramatically as we have access to medical care. 100% different than what we had when we were young. A long time ago, it took days sometimes to get to any kind of source, medical source. So we run programs for prevention so that people are aware of what can happen. We're talking about like things like nutrition and how to eat healthy. So you're preventing the illnesses like heart disease, diabetes, blood pressure problems, things like that. Everything is normal in my body, in my lungs, in my heart, in my blood pressure. I believe Health Canada works for us. We don't work for them. I tell them what we need because what works for one community doesn't work for another community. And who are they to make that decision? You know, seriously. Okay, <laughs> cut that all out. Under my field as the addictions counselor, I deal with uh, drug and alcohol and whatever addictions may be, gambling, whatever. Mental health, we, we can use ceremonies like the sweat lots. Prayer out, you know, smudging the individual. We have to touch on addictions. We have to touch. Well, on the root people. causes of addiction is intergenerational trauma. That's why we have so many, so many people addicted to things around here. Is they're just they're suffering. Take a step further. I'll I'll bring a psychologist or a psychiatrist here. But success to me is uh, taking one individual and bringing them in for treatment and coming out uh, and them knowing how to deal with their addictions problems. As for our traditional lands, the green line signifies the area that the government of Alberta has told us where our traditional lands are. This is where we currently are now, the Gregoire Lake Reserve, which is just south of Gregoire Lake. The reserve is too small, and it, it was too small from the very beginning. 
So in 1918, if you weren't in Fort McMurray on the day to receive your $5 as per Treaty 8, you weren't counted in that selection. That's where that, that treaty land entitlement comes from. The federal government has to provide that amount that was missed. If you think about it, you know, there's oil and gas leases everywhere. So where do you find land within this region that is crown land, unoccupied, and contiguous to this nation? It doesn't exist. This is an example of a, of a map. This, I believe this map shows cut lines and seismic lines that are around us. So it obviously affects our way of life. We cannot practice our traditional way of life the way we used to. But it's not just industry. I mean, you have 100,000 people now within this region using the land. It doesn't just have to be hunting, fishing, gathering. It could be quadding, it could be camping, it could be whatever you want. It's land users, more of them, and the land's not getting any bigger. Unfortunately, we're now in 2017 trying to right the wrongs of 1919, 100 years later. That's going to be a challenge, and um, that I do know that they are working towards that. Uh, probably in the next two to three years, we may have a settlement offer from Canada uh, in regards to the treaty land entitlement. In the end, it's their membership that is deciding on is the deal that is struck with the federal government, will this be something that we can live with for the rest of our lives? Because this is it. When we was a little boy, we uh, were always listening to our parents. Of course, we had a very, very high respect for our grandparents, for our elders. We have to instill in those children that culture, the language, the traditions, the knowledge that gained the medicine parts of it. We need to keep that alive because when you kill your language, you kill your culture. In school, no. We weren't allowed to speak anything but French. We were dropped into the school like a bunch of puppies or something, and and we weren't allowed to speak our language. Well, when I went to university, I went and did my Bachelor of Science, so I've done a lot of programs. I got to come back and work with my tribal council and help them build this app. And It has the, the English, the Cree, they can hear it, and it'll, it'll speak to you the word. The papa. Go, go. <laughs> And it's all hands-on teaching, sharing, yeah, sharing knowledge. You want to give it a shot? Sure. What this is all about is making the height smooth. And then you're supposed to pull your hand down. Like. Just grab this one. Each time I look at these youth, the kids that are, are doing something for the community, that's what I said earlier. It, it's in my heart. I know they're doing good. They're going to be really good citizens. And I see them doing things that... I hadn't seen in a long time. They're, they're kind of community oriented. They're doing things that help the elders. They're doing things to try to bring back the knowledge and the culture and the traditions that are lacking in our community. You know, I still need my culture to carry on. I need my culture to make sure that my, my society, my 468 First Nations continues. When it comes to identity for myself, I, I never knew who I was or still really don't know to this day who I my ancestors are. I know my, my father's a Mohawk Indian from the Michelle Band, and that's about it, right? And definitely when I come to work at the Nation here, you know, they've become my family, but really it's about me finding out who I am so my kids know who they are. The advancements in the eight pillars have been advancements towards one goal, to become a self-sufficient nation for the next seven generations, and to control their own destiny. But there is more going on here than material progress. The nation based the eight pillars and all of their goals on a core of traditional values, spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental strength. Everything that's happening now is the nation's modern expression of these traditional values. The pursuit of the eight pillars is a renewal of the spirit of the nation. The spirit of the people is finally starting to show. Now finally we have younger people that, that do have spirit that are fighting all those things that we lost. I think a lot of people have a lot of 
really great things to offer one another. And I feel like it's really important that people care about your dreams and your aspirations. Speak up where you have to. You don't have to agree to everything. We have a voice, so I think they should use it to uh, better our community as a whole, as a people. I want to see less drug and alcohol use for the future. And I would like to see everybody being kinder to each other and like helping each other out more. There's lots of hope to get people together, to work together for, for the greater good. It's very hard to do, but I believe it can be done. It used to be a very divided community with families pitted against each other, but because we have strong leadership and because we can see light at the end of the tunnel because of economic prosperity, people are coming together and being more cohesive and working together, and I'm very proud of them for that. If you're gonna go hunting, Hunt for an education. Hunt for something that you can help the community with. Something that'll feed all the families. And go hunting for something that'll give everything we can to our nation. We are First Nations people. We are strong, we're Aboriginal, we're united, and we have to stay united. Prosperity has brought new hope and renewed spirit, but prosperity also brings new problems. The challenges they now face are not only material, but challenges to the spirit of the nation. As the community is poised for success, it now has to consider the impact of sudden wealth. Treaty 8 promised agricultural benefits. Each family was supposed to receive 160 acres of land and cows and plows to start a farm. Well, we received an offer from Canada to settle our agricultural benefit claim. It's been ongoing for over 20 years. We're ratifying it with the people now, so they're, they're voting to accept the offer from Canada and accept what the nation has planned to do with the money. Our ban and our chief and council, well, along with the people, can decide where they're going to put it, what pillars they're going to put it, you know, housing, wellness, the Crown has offered the nation $34.8 million to settle the claim for all band members. But Chief and Council have proposed to divide the money. Half would go to individuals now, and half would be invested for the future needs of the nation. So the vote today for the Fort McMurray First Nation ratification um, for the cows and plows, as they call it, or agricultural benefits agreement. And we'll have a little bit of money in the pocket for now, and, but our kids will benefit greatly. But some people have been waiting their entire lives for this money and want it all now. And I had already said that I wanted my, 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 all my benefits because I didn't think I was going to live this long. I'm not ready to uh, give up on the money I've been waiting for. That settlement is to the nation. A lot of people interpret it as a settlement to each individual because unfortunately, you had to come up with the number somehow. And this is huge. It's final forever. So once it's done, it's done. Well, I think the leadership is, is challenged um, in terms of you don't have that trust. The trust was broken um, years actually in, in the making. So for people to now give that trust, they're very guarded with it. Chief Ron took a very uh, hard stance against, you know, just dwindling that away, you know, and not have anything in return. You know, we want to continue to invest for, you know, the next se seven generations or more. I mean, trust is, is earned, but it, they're not going to go out of their way in the sense of, you know, do anything they possibly can to gain that trust. I mean, these guys make a lot of decisions on a daily basis that are disappointing to individuals, but as a whole of a community, they make sense. When I first moved here, uh, our youth office was in the medical building, and it had burned down because an election didn't go the way people wanted it to. That danger, it, it's huge. Maybe some people are going to be mad, but really they are just thinking about the best interests of their people and the children, because we know what's out there, and we know the problems here. And, you know, it's scary. Very, very scary. We can't just give lump sum. We cannot do that. I know if everybody got 20000 today, it would be one hell of a party there for a week or two. 
and some of you are going to get hurt, right? So My concern is for our, our people who have addictions, to help them understand, you know, you're only getting this 20,000 once, don't blow it all on drug dealers, they're the ones making the living, you might die from this. And there's people here that love them and care about them and don't want to lose them. So be careful when you have all this money. You know, you're going to be a superhero for a month, but that's it. That's why I give out loans now, because the, the more I give out loans, the less they're going to have. It's going to kind of work into it. Lawyer said, oh, you can't give out loans. I said, do you want to bet? You want a loan? <laughs> right now we have the, the Trudeau government, which is really for the First Nation people. If people vote no, uh, the agreement will have to go back to Canada's table. The next government even, if they'll even consider coming back for the, uh, bringing this to the table again. So, everybody vote yes! <laughs> From Edmonton we got all the results and uh, it turned out that it's 303 yeses to 63 noes. Uh, I thought that was a good indication of uh, how the people are pulling together. I know what happens when people who don't know what to do with money get a large amount of money. And generally it's not good things. I mean, even money from residential school that people have gotten. I mean, people have gotten anywhere from 50000 to $300,000. And that money has gone like this. Nobody has anything to show for it. There's life and death going on here. Um, two years ago, almost two years ago, a man was uh, murdered in his home, just right over there. After um, uh, after a Christmas party and, and everybody had their $1,000. Is there a risk of having too much money, too, too much success or prosperity? That's the biggest fear. If we can't create a process or a system that manages economic wealth, we're gonna probably do more damage than the history has done. Prosperity can build, but it can also destroy. But what is truly striking is the honesty. It's not that they already have all the answers. It's that they are facing those questions head on every day. And perhaps the biggest question of all, how are they facing contradictions that touch on the very core identity of the nation? The wealth of the entire region comes from a controversial source. Yeah, that's the sink group plant there that I worked at for 30 years. Uh, that smokestack that you see on the right is 600 feet high. All that black stuff that you see is all tar sand. The whole environment has changed with oil and gas. My grandchild will be 70 years old by the time some of these projects are complete and they start actually doing the reclamation. But that's 70 years from now, what about all those skills and teachings? They'll be lost. So we're supposed to be keepers of the land and it's really hard to maintain that identity and, and who you once were. Living off the land and stuff like that is, is out of the picture now. No one can do it. So you can't live off the land. So what else do you do? You make the best of what, what you have, right? There's a perception that First Nations are trying to protect their interests when really they are truly protecting the land. First Nations sees land as though we belong to it, not it belongs to us. And that's something that it's hard to wrap your head around if you are not embedded in the culture. The culture that gives the nation strength holds the land to be sacred. At the same time, this nation is participating in the exploitation of its resources, a seemingly impossible contradiction. So our youth on the nation here, I find that they have to live in two different worlds. They have the spiritual world, and then you have your modern technology. And for us, it's finding a balance to incorporate both worlds. We do have a lot of industry around us, and we'll take tours of industry and that type of thing, but we also look at the other side of reclamation and looking at the future and how to recover from that. Yeah, we are having our annual healing gathering here on Gregor Lake, our Willow Lake. We are concerned about what's going on on our land and, uh, and, and our water. We're not here just to look after ourselves. We look after everybody. When we see our prayers, we pray for everyone that's here even the oil, oil executives. 
they they need they need help too to understand and and learn respect. I had an oil company representative tell me one time that that the oil company didn't even consider them an impacted community. You turn that around to today, you have to talk to Fort McMurray First Nation. They're a major player. Yeah, right now our First Nation is is tied to the to the price of oil. When the oil goes in a slump, we feel the economic hurt here. We probably have 40 years, a 40 year window to diversify our economy before the oil's gone. You know, a big part of that is being a self-sufficient First Nation. I think in the past, industry seen working with First Nations as a check on a box that they needed, and now they're seeing the value in having a true relationship with, with the nation. You know, it's almost embarrassing to bring up what the, the old mindset was. In the past, oil companies would try to determine what would be the thing that we'd want to do for the band. That is actually the band's business to understand, and they, they understand what their community needs are. If you think about how far Fort McMurray First Nation has come in the last 10 years, and it boggles your mind to think how far they'll go in the next 20. It was only when we gained capacity, and they had no choice in order to sit down and negotiate with us, um, that they realized that they were missing out on the opportunities that we could have. I believe we, we've always been ready to partner with anyone. Um, it's just that nobody asked us. Treaties were made just to let them know that we had peaceful intentions if the settlers want to come and settle. But they never, the ancestors never gave up the land or the rights to it or subsurface or the water or anything. All they did was made an agreement to let people live here in peace. And that's what we're doing. We're honoring that treaty. Every year at Treaty Days, each band member receives $5, as was agreed to more than 100 years ago in Treaty 8. So what are you going to do with your five dollars? I said I would buy some chewing gum, but I don't know chewing gum. about it. Maybe I'll buy candy instead. At first, it seems strange that they would bother to line up and receive five dollars once a year. But treaty money is a symbol of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship that still exists. They are honoring the treaty, and they expect all Canadians, ourselves included, to honor it in kind. The Crown signed the treaties on behalf of all Canadians. Every Canadian participates in the treaties, and we all inherit the benefits, the beauty of the land, the riches of its resources. It is the land we share. I think this is the same for every First Nation. If we are unable to heal from the past, if we become essentially those, those colonized beings, um, then the colonization process has succeeded. It has beat us. And First Nations culture and community will be no more. It's, it's really evolves around money, but it it's, has to be more than that. It has to be about healing this community, righting the, the wrongs of the past. And um, how do you do that? I mean, it's through spirituality, culture, and language, right? And you know, I believe our opportunities gives us the means to be able to actually put focus and priority back into to those areas. Um, at that point, I think it's really going to allow the community to heal as a whole. The balance between culture and development is a question that this nation will ultimately answer on its own terms. But this is not the only challenge to the spirit of this nation. Even as the nation looks into its own future, it also looks for healing, a journey that is ongoing and for many demands tremendous courage. You know, we tried our best with our kids and uh, prayed the best way we could for them too. And people say, you know, do the best you can, they'll turn out okay, they'll do good. <clears throat> Pray, like really mean it. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll be okay. And... Yeah, recently in the community we had a, a suicide and uh, she, was, uh, she was the first youth that I met when I first came out here. And she was, uh, she was a bright girl, she, she was happy, she was always in our program. And when we lose somebody within the community, every single family feels it 
you know, and being that she was so young, yes, it's really, really more heartfelt. We also lost an elder the week prior, you know, and we all mourned, but it wasn't as tragic as when you lose to suicide. So. Can you talk at all about it? Not yet? I can talk about it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, you know, it hurts a lot. It still hurts, it brings up a lot of memories. I lost a son to uh, addictions about a year and a half ago. And then a couple of months ago, we lost Chelsea. How everybody came together at the funeral, that's how everybody should have been even before then. It was you didn't have to come to that point for everybody to come together. It seems like some sort of tragedy has to happen before something good comes out of it, before we can be together, before we can actually be a family like we're supposed to be. You know, if this is going to anybody that's prejudiced or racist or whatever, I really hope they absorb it. Brian shared his story with us, calling for his own nation to come together and for all Canadians to understand that he and all of his people have walked through fire to stand where they are at this crossroads in their history. And it was a time of disaster that truly revealed their strength and the spirit of generosity in this nation. Just head north on 63 and follow May 3rd, 2016. This radio station is unmanned. 80,000 people evacuated Fort McMurray as forest fires threatened the city. Tens of thousands took refuge at 468 First Nation. So within not even an hour, there was about 60,000 people, like no room to move. So we started passing water around. Then I was helping out at the Petro, our um, First Nations Petro can, and uh, helping pump gas. There was bumper to bumper traffic here. We had our members coming from their homes, inviting strangers really into their homes. Like I slept in a bed and I let the people come in. There was about four or five different families in my home. And we started hugging. Oh, well, we were crying at the same time because everybody was crying and I'm, I was crying too. When it comes down to tragedy, everyone's equal. We're going to do whatever we can to help people. The trees um, were already on fire on this side. The, the most hugest flames. Oh my, wow. <laughs> I lost my house. We lost our house to, to the, the wildfires. So. And at that point, we knew that there was nothing being done for the reserve here. And all, all of our homes and everything were at jeopardy. So uh, Chief sat down, made a plan. We actually drove right through the fire. At that point, I was uh, vibrating. I get kind of emotional thinking about it now. And uh, I asked the Chief, uh, like, are we going to turn around? He said, no, we're not. And so me and him, we raced through the flames, like literally through the fire. It was, it was terrifying. It was, it was in, like you said, the whole time chief with nerves of steel. He had a mission and we were gonna fulfill it, right? But every night it was kind of scary here because there was a lot of smoke and, uh, and I, didn't, I wasn't sure, you know, if it was <laughs> gonna burn us up or what. The, the chief and uh, the council staying back to build firewall and making sure that our reserve was okay. Like I'm completely proud of being a part of this community and our leadership that we have in place, all of the staff. It was just the whole community coming together to help our fellow man, right? You know, we all come back to the community, and I was sitting over there, and I got a call. The individual then in line said they were calling from the uh, the palace, and I said, the palace? And of course, Chief is just scratching his head, why, <laughs> right? Less than a week after that, we had the Countess of Sussex here shaking hands and kissing babies and, and present uh, the Chief with the uh, award for his bravery and his leadership during the fire. And lo and behold, uh, Councillor Kreutzer shoots a moose, you know, not 10 minutes after the Countess has left. And we've got a crowd of people come over, heard about her right away on a reserve. We're out there in our suit clothes, skinning a moose. He has a white shirt on, it's covered in blood. The moose was a way bigger deal to them guys than 
somebody from the palace come to visit. We didn't grow up learning royalty, but people know about moose, so that's why they're happy. <laughs> Fort McMurray First Nation 468 has revitalized their community through the eight pillars. They are examining the balance between industry and their role as keepers of the land. They are caring for each other and facing the past. There is diversity of efforts and unity of purpose. They are engaged both in material development and a spiritual enterprise. And there is a lot we could learn from them and with them about building a nation. Maybe it's the beginning of a new story of these nations arising. We need to become self-governing. We need to diversify our economy, all the while preserving our traditional ways and language. You know, we have a clear vision for the future of our nation, and we need all our nation members to take part in this vision, because it's going to take all of us to get it done. This is how we honour the sacrifices our, our ancestors and our elders made for us. I love working for my community. I love getting up in the morning, coming to work every day. It's the best job. I've ever had, it's the best job I will ever have in my lifetime. I really do, I do love this community. I love all the people in it. And I care for the kids, mostly the kids because they are our future. The children, I always love the children. Love is exactly the word. I love every one of these people, even, even the, the people that I don't get along with. Really grateful, for sure. It's definitely helpful to have people that I found in this nation be able to help you and stuff, it made a huge difference to me, so. I should have been an actress. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, the nation will be here, I think, for many moons yet, but. <laughs> Yes.